you would then be causing the um, outer elements to go into hoop tension, the inner ones to go into hoop compression. So those are clearly not rigid body modes, neither the rotation of this cross section nor the translation outward. The problem statement uh, typically implies that this cross section cannot rotate about the axis and removing further degrees of freedom. So if you do have a ring element, in many codes, um, it is presumed then to only have the remaining degree of freedom uh, of sliding along the axis, sort of like the ring on your finger could slide along your finger. That would be the only rigid body mode in, in several of the codes. The SAP series um, used to be that way, as I recall. Now, on the other hand, in some codes, uh, if this ring element may be embedded in a fully three-dimensional space and might be allowed to rotate and do some of these other actions. So, so I view the axisymmetric case as very special and very code dependent in terms of rigid body modes. Make sure you check out your element and see what its, uh, what its mobility is in a three-dimensional space. I've tried to summarize some of this previous discussion in a little chart, and sometimes these are um, good for purposes of argument, but are not airtight. In this case, uh, certainly it's true that the three-dimensional body in a three-dimensional space will have six rigid body modes. So that one we can uh, say is an airtight situation. When you come to two dimensions, then the question is, does the element lie in a plane or is it allowed to float in space? If it's called a plane stress element, it often infers that it is restricted to lie in a given plane, and then you would have perhaps only three rigid body modes remaining in your, in your structure. Um, on the other hand, other codes will call it a membrane element and will allow it to float in the three-dimensional space, in which case uh, such a membrane body would really have six rigid body modes remaining. So this one's a little more argumentative, likewise with plane strain. Um, the SAP codes used to uh, embed these in a two-dimensional space such that they really only had three uh, rigid body modes. Axisymmetry, likewise, is argumentative. Uh, what do you mean by the axisymmetric element? Is it a ring? Uh, is it a ring that can really move in freely in three-dimensional space, or is it just a cross-section which uh, is not allowed to move about the axis, but only slide along it like the ring in your finger? And that's what I'm assuming here, is that this is a classical old-time axisymmetric concept. Uh, one-dimensional situations are not encountered much. You'd, you would have one-dimensional elements lying on a one-dimensional line, and there would only be a single rigid body mode in that case, which would be sliding along that same line. So I do talk here about how the codes vary widely and how these subcases are handled, and you must check out the individual elements. Let's have a little practice at removing rigid body modes. This is something the engineer must be aware of. It requires that you use single point constraints, typically as many as you have rigid body modes to be removed, and the uh, engineer must figure what points on the body can be constrained in order to remove the rigid body modes without doing any additional constraint that, that would imply restraining the body unduly. Here's a picture of a blimp, and I'm going to consider four points on the blimp, the nose and the tail, which are solid fixtures, uh, fittings, perhaps aluminum uh, uh, tie-down points. Then the gondola that would be a, a sheet metal uh, and sheet and stringer construction, and then a point out on the membrane envelope of the body. Well, if we want to remove rigid body modes, the easiest way is to find one node, such as number two on the gondola, and restrict all six degrees of freedom to be zero. That's easy. That will, in fact, knock out all of the rigid body modes. What you're doing then is basically holding the body at that point and holding it for observation purposes. Purposes. Sometimes I say that this is a photographic thing where you want to be able to get a good picture of the body. 
Now let's take a more ambitious removal of rigid body modes by dealing with the front and the back uh, through solid elements. Node 1 and node 3 are those fittings, and I'm only allowed to handle translations. And so if I do, I'm, I'm going to take the three translations at the nose, which um, are shown in this figure below, and then at the tail, I'm only going to trans, I'm going to uh, constrain the translations in the two and the three directions. Now, the two and the three directions are th the ones that are vertical and horizontal out toward the viewer. So what we have now is a blimp that is pinned at the nose, and then the tail has been restrained to prevent pitching and yawing. But what we haven't restrained yet is rolling. In other words, spinning about the longitudinal axis. And to do that, we need to go somewhere else such that we can prevent that rolling motion. And if we just pick any point on the membrane surface and find one that ha can be constrained in the two direction, which is out of the page of the paper for us, then that will knock out that rolling um, degree of freedom. This could not lie on the horizontal um, center line of the body. It would have to be up off the center line so that you could get some uh, implied moment from such a constraint if need be. Then um, a bad case that I show, uh, in other words, a straw man for trying to deal with rigid body modes, is shown below here, and that's where I only pin the nose and the tail and don't bother to really look at it further. What would happen there is you would have indeed established pins at the nose and the tail, sort of universal joints that can't move in the three directions. But this would not prevent the rolling motion at all. So you've missed constraining the rolling motion. Furthermore, you've done something bad. You have not allowed the body to have any net stretch in the fore and aft direction. And uh, that means that there can't be any straining or any internal um, or any substantial uh, thrust in this direction internally because you're because you're grounding those any possible loads that way, pressure loads or whatever. So this is bad. We have missed the restraint of one of the rigid body modes, and we have added a restraint which is unwanted on an elastic type of motion, namely stretching of the fuselage. We mentioned earlier the possibility that a portion of a structure could become loose in some sense and clatter around. These are called mechanisms. And the first example we gave was the receiver of a phone falling off on the desk. But this happens quite a bit. And sometimes there are physical mechanisms, sliders, pin joints, and so on that uh, have some useful function. Sometimes it's merely a modeling error. Let me show you an example of a modeling error that I made one time. And uh, oh yes, professors and consultants do occasion once in a great while make an error. And if you're fortunate, you catch it, as I did. Um, in fact, I guess you could say most finite element people get smarter and smarter by making errors. And when you make errors at 3 AM and you've got a job due the next morning, you tend to remember that. Well, this one didn't keep me up at night, but it was uh, puzzling at first in any event. This is a load ramp, which is built primarily of I-beams running across the bed with a metal grating on top. Now, the, the grating is not primary structure, so I removed it. But the uh, load on this is typically a forklift truck that runs up and down with four wheels. And so there's a load pattern on the bed of this particular ramp. And then the beams will carry that out to the sidewalls. The sidewalls are plates. They have uh, caps at the top and bottom that stiffen them. But I did calculate the stresses on this. And um, later, about two weeks after delivering the results on stresses and sizing the body and showing how it was critical here and not critical there and so on, uh, I looked 
by chance at the output and found that there were 10 to the 32nd radians of rotation about the beam axis. And I was appalled. It was clear that I had missed something, <laughs> obviously. And what I found then in retrospect was that this beam member across the bay here, and there were several of them because you need to um, have load application points in the interior. But this beam-like structure through the center of the bed here, uh, although it has stiffness in respect to torsion about its axis, it was being connected at the two ends to plates that have no drilling degree of freedom stiffness. In other words, the classical Kirchhoff love plate theory, if you have a plate, it has no stiffness in regard to this torsional or this twisting degree of freedom called a drilling degree of freedom. Therefore, the beam was free to spin about its own axis. Now, this is not the kind of a problem that's easy to see mathematically because you don't get zeros on the main diagonal of the matrix or at any single degree of freedom going bad. Rather, you get this total body called a mechanism, which in my case, let's say, was consisting of three beam elements end to end. And it, in total, was free to spin. Well, I, uh, I grounded those um, those beam elements at one end or the other through just a grounding of that torsional degree of freedom and, you know, constraining it to zero, in other words, and then redid the stress calculation and found that it didn't affect the results at all. So the code I was using was strong enough to overcome that singularity or near singularity uh, with the amount of precision that it was solving. And uh, I'm still a little mystified that it did so well. Most codes nowadays won't even allow a solution if you have a singularity on that order. Um, another problem where this comes up is when you join plates, beams, and, and shells to solids because the solid itself will not provide any rotation the last entry in our rogues gallery of bad things that can happen to you en route to a stress solution is the nodal singularity. And this is where you have your mesh developed and a number of nodes. And off here at some particular node, you have not connected enough elements to restrain the degrees of freedom in all six directions. In other words, there might be one direction which has no element restraining it. That becomes singular then. And it's called a nodal singularity or a grid point singularity. Uh, this one, in fact, uh, can be sniffed out by logic and by analysis because the computer code can concentrate on the stiffness for that single node and can do an eigenvalue problem and check the translational stiffness and then the rotational stiffness and develop the principal directions of stiffness and find the weakest one and find if it's zero. If it is, then that degree of freedom is bad. Um, there would be in the NASTRAN codes, for instance, the process called the automatic single point constraint feature, and it's a parameter that's set, the auto SPC, that will faithfully look through your entire list of nodes and find out which degrees of freedom are singular for you, and then print out a table. It will also fix that up for you and allow a run. Sometimes this is useful in training cases because it gets a run even if it's a fictitious body you have just studied. I know some of my professional friends feel that it's a little dangerous to use the auto SPC because it might hide, it might fix up and then hide a problem in the model. But uh, that's something that's well worth the risk in many cases. Certainly you should look at the uh, constraint list that's been invoked then by your um, automatic searching out of those uh, bad directions and then try to fix that if it's a, a modeling error. Let's do some problems now. And our first problem is going to be a body that we'd like to stress analyze, but it has a rigid body mode present. Let's look at the 
um, elastic de deflection of this particular beam structure that is guided between two rigid walls. This means that the uh, ends here, captured by plates, slide freely up and down. And um, there is, therefore, that rigid body mode possible. Yet the live loads are in equilibrium and form a well-posed problem where presumably this structure is going to bow in the middle in such a way. The body is symmetric, so it's possible to exploit the symmetry here also. And uh, between the two then, between the uh, outright removal of rigid body modes or the use of symmetry, we want to make sure that we have a well-posed problem when we finish. Um, and the question would be then, how would you set this problem up? The logic of our solution is that we'd like to remove that rigid body mode so that it doesn't affect the elastic solution. Also, if possible, let's exploit the plane of reflective symmetry and solve only half the problem. Those two ideas couple together then in this figure shown here where we see the four relevant degrees of freedom of the left-hand side of the body. Now, interestingly, we need to specify either the force-like or the displacement-like quantity in each of the coordinates. Because there is a, a guided condition at the left end, we know that u2 is zero. And because there's a reflective plane at the center of the body, we know that u4 is zero. Then uh, we have kind of a shearing situation where the body is going to be sheared by the live loads, which act at the uh, left end and at the center. At this point, we can remove the rigid body mode in sort of an arbitrary way. We could either fix the uh, vertical displacement at the left end or the right end. And arbitrarily, I'm going to set the translation u3 to be 0, OK? So I'm going to remove the rigid body mode by holding the beam fixed in our view at the center and allowing the left end to move upward. Let's combine those arguments about the displacements in this set of equilibrium equations. The sliding support on the left end enforces zero rotation there. The symmetry condition at the center of the beam enforces zero rotation here. And then our arbitrary removal of the rigid body mode by constraining the center of the beam in translation goes here. We've allowed the left end to be the live loaded end with this live load here. We don't know the moments that are required to hold the zero slopes at the um, left and, and center of the beam. Uh, and at the cut plane, reflective plane, um, we know the live load there, but we don't know the interior shear force, which is then released by cutting it. And so we don't know the total reaction there. All told, we have four equations and four unknowns, but only one of the displacements is unknown. So that uncouples nicely. And we can solve directly then for the displacement u1 as the live load of 2,000 and divided by this stiffness, this ei uh, 12 uh, over length, length cubed. And um, solving for that, we get 0 0.0167 millimeters up. So the body does move upward at the left end. And as measured relative to our initial coordinate system lined up with the undeflected body on its axis. Our second problem will be one involving a reflective plane and then inferring some stiffness terms in the matrix for a single element. Here I show a hypothetical kite-shaped finite element with four nodes. And the reflective plane passes through the nodes 1 and 3 on the x-axis. I propose an experiment where we constrain the left three nodes, 1, 2, and 4, and then load the 
right node with this 200 newton force at 45 degrees. And then we find that these are the resulting displacements. Now notice that they are not the same. In other words, this system um, is not symmetric in regard to stiffness in the horizontal and the vertical direction at this point. And that's what you'd expect. You'd expect it to be somewhat stiffer in the horizontal direction and ha therefore have a smaller displacement because you're on axis. If you think of terms of beam theory, whereas the vertical displacement is more involves something like a bending motion. So the question is, find as many of the stiffness terms as you can. Now the solution will involve setting up the equilibrium equations for this uh, experiment that was discussed. Um, we really have an 8 by 8 matrix here. So this is not a small matrix and we wonder how many of these terms we might be able to find. The experiment per se though would uh, say that we clamp the grid points shown here and the, this one and this one. And so we're imposing these displacements one and two according to these loads over here. This is really sort of a, uh, an, oh, what would you call it, a synthesis. We're really backing out of the results that we have what the system properties are. And in question are then these four stiffness terms. Now, of course, the off-diagonal terms must be equal, so that cuts it to three stiffness terms involved in this set of two equations. So we do have here then, directly from our equilibrium, two equations in three unknowns. And the question is, is all lost, or can we still use some of the information about the symmetry of the system? So we can back off at this point and do some arguments about the symmetry of the problem and see if that will allow some simplification. Let's consider a mental experiment similar to what uh, we've done in our lecture. If this is a reflective symmetric plane on this axis and then we modeled half the problem, we know that um, loads upon the um, on this body that are symmetric should cause symmetric boundary conditions on this cut plane. Among those would be then that there should be no vertical displacement here, U6, corresponding to such a symmetric live load, uh, F5. It's true in this case that the live load uh, may be hard to figure as a symmetric load, but it is, even though it's on the reflective plane. So when we set up uh, an equation for such a situation, we would have this set of equations below, and we're mostly interested then in the, um, what would be the sixth equation. It would say K5-6 times U5 um, plus K6-6 times 0 equals 0, and that immediately gives the result in the next figure. So I'll write that result down immediately. And that's helpful to us because in our given physical, physical experiment, we had two coupled equations. And apparently at that time we had three unknowns, but now we're allowed to cancel out the uh, coupling terms, which must be zero by, by this reflective symmetry. And that allows us to find K55 and K66 at that point. Now we can make other symmetry arguments as that first one. For instance, if we were to apply a live load to the left end of the element, we shouldn't get any displacement in the two direction. That leads to this hope then that K12 and K21 are both zero. You can do the same on, in the uh, coupled case where you uh, load in the one direction here and um, in the x direction on degree of freedom or, or grid point one. And then you shouldn't get any displacement here in the sixth coordinate direction. So that gives you the k16 and k61 to be zero. And then lastly, on the um, comparable thing, if we load the right side and then look at the displacement at the left, we get this last one. So we really have found, let's see, 
K56, K65, there's four there, and there's two, four, six more here. So, so it appears that we have found tan stiffness components from, the, from that original physical load case as well as our symmetry arguments. Problem three has to do with a children's playground device called a teeter-totter. Here you have a body that's pivoted at the middle. It's basically a beam-like body. Um, there are two loads on it which correspond to a heavier child sitting at a shorter distance and a lighter child at a farther distance from the pivot. The children figure this out pretty fast, and so it's interesting that they understand static equilibrium. Then, of course, their whole goal is to balance in a way that with very small forces, either they can rotate this and jump up and down at, at will. Our question is, how can we turn this into a stress and displacement problem from this statement? Because you see, obviously, there's a rigid body mode present, and the uh, stiffness matrix, if not modified, would be singular, and you'd fail in your solution. Well, below I show the solution where I'm going to use three beam elements for an exact solution. The solution would be exact because the Euler-Bernoulli beam element using a cubic shape function is exact when there are only n loads on it. And that's all we have at this point. If we subdivide appropriately with the child's position as a force, the central pivot, and the second child, we really don't need the outboard unloaded beam element at the right, but I'll put it in because we might be interested in displacements. In the theory, that should be at zero stress and, and is going along for the ride in all senses of the word. Our goal is to set up the equations of equilibrium for this system, and so we need to make an assumption now on removing the rigid body mode. My suggestion is to set the rotation at the pivot point to be zero. That um, lets the teeter-totter deflect about a position that's a horizontal position, a rather nice reference position. You could, in fact, however, have constrained any of the other free degrees of freedom to zero in order to remove the rigid body mode. I find it a little better, though, to put the constraint on an unloaded degree of freedom so that you don't get into the worry about the constraint force that you've added and whether it has to also ground a live load. But it would be, in principle, possible to have constrained any one of a number of degrees of freedom. Now, our resulting equations look as below. It's an 8 by 8 matrix formed from the three different beam elements which we've assembled here in these 4x4 four four matrices. So you can get these um, outlined here. And of course, zero is on the outside. The pinned condition calls for zero translation uh, at this degree of freedom. And then, then our assumption on removing rigid body modes has led us to put a zero in this location for the rotation. We're able to put the live loads on the system, the two live loads. And then we can solve for the reactions at the pin, namely the physical translation, and then F4 plays the role of the moment of constraint there. We'll treat it as if it's unknown and solve for it, and then hope that it comes out to be zero. We wouldn't want our force of constraint in this case to, uh, to remove the rigid body mode to have a finite value. We'd like it to be just like a kind of fairy fingers coming in and just softly centering that teeter-totter while the kids are in perfect balance on it. So that's our set of equations which are then solved. Problem four is an exercise on looking at a system with a reflective plane and applying anti-symmetric loads. Let's look at this bracket here made of two beams welded together, and it would be a frame in the civil engineering sense. 
This load uh, applied at the junction is vertical. Uh, the reflective plane of symmetry of geometry materials and boundary conditions passes through this x-axis and is through the, the joint. So what we need to learn is how to handle the boundary conditions at this reflective plane, how to handle the load, how you recover the results in the image half of the solution that's not modeled. First of all, in the solution, you would recognize that this is an anti-symmetric load, and that's not really trivial. For bodies that are loaded on the reflective plane, sometimes it's better to break it into two halves and split it between the real and the uh, virtual image or the mirror image. If we did that, we'd have a half load up here and a half load here. And then you can see that those are not legitimate mirror images. In fact, they're the opposite of what you'd expect. So it's a pure anti-symmetric load. It's not a general load. And we'll assume that we're going to solve the problem in the plane, in the xy plane, so we're not worried about out-of-plane bending. The boundary conditions on the cut edge there where we apply the reflective plane can be found by arguments similar to what we did in the lecture, and you may need to review that. Uh, they include these six conditions. Now, when you apply a live load at that same point, it complicates things a bit because rather than a force to be zero in the direction, let's say, U5, uh, the boundary conditions per se are saying that the interior force is zero. So rather than really using this one that says F5 equals zero, we're going to replace that with the one that says that that cut uh, edge is loaded by an external live load of minus script F over 2. The minus because this is a downward load. Here you notice that I've got the real image on top and the, and the mirror or the virtual image below, which we do not worry about. Uh, the displacement boundary condition at that cut edge is that there's no displacement horizontally. That's because, as in the general axi anti-symmetric case, that were there a load to the right above, there would have to be one to the left below, and then the presumption is that a point caught on the halfway between could neither move right nor left. The last idea we're interested in is how you might recover forces, displacements, stresses in the mirror image. And to do that, there really are two ways to look at it. They're, they're equivalent, ultimately. One would be to look at the image half as if it were, in fact, reflected onto the real half that you've studied, and then just change the signs on all of the quantities. You can interpret everything in terms of a right-handed coordinate system that way. Then somehow you're going to have to, in your mind, reflect that back that body back onto its true uh, virtual image behind the reflective plane. But it lets you use a right-handed coordinate system. The other process would be to look at the um, body, the image uh, body, uh, in, in the position where it really is and use left-handed coordinate systems there and then take the results from the real solution and change the signs on them. Either way, you're forced to either reflect, uh, you reflect the body one way or the other. But I have a suspicion that most people would prefer to do the first process of just imagine that lower half of the body reflected on the upper half and then just change signs on everything. And um, uh, that way you can continue to use a right-handed coordinate system. Now, as you can see, some of you are probably a little fuzzy about now reaching for your coffee cup or, or worse, <laughs> a shot of whiskey after that one. Um, you, you might say that's a lot of trouble, and it turns out it is. Um, also, graphics packages often are not helpful in showing a reflected uh, image, uh, nor the cyclic symmetry problems that are, that are theoretically possible. So, in fact, the, the practicing engineers nowadays will often solve the whole problem and 
let the graphics package then present you with the stresses in the other half of the problem in a very direct way with no, uh, without use of left-handed coordinate systems or any such artifice. You just don't exploit the reflective plane. I think for someone who only use, uses this reflective plane idea once in a great while, maybe it is better to not um, take the risk. But if you're in a technology that has reflected planes and they're really important, then you'd better think about um, organizing and exploiting the reflective plane and only using half of the body. Okay, that finishes our problem session.